Climate change is a big problem. The temperatures are rising, sea levels are going up, and the Arctic ice is melting. We know the reason, carbon dioxide, but we don't know how to solve it. It's clear that concerted international response is needed, but the politicians appear to be unable to do this. Why? Climate change is a global problem. Politics is local. Climate change is long-term. Politics is short-term. With the best will in the world, they're incapable of taking appropriate action. You always see in the newspaper links, a confusion abounds, links between weather and climate. We know we've had a rotten winter. A lot of people have suffered. A lot of people have had hardship, uh, extreme rainfall, and storm damage. Lots of euros, mega euros lost. Okay, and the papers seem to know the reason. This is to do with global warming. We have no justification for making a link between extreme weather and global warming. The scientific basis for that does not exist. So these are spurious. Let me give you an example of a spurious um, attribution. In 1590, King James VI of Scotland went off to Denmark to collect his new bride. Uh, his ship was affected by a major storm and he had to, to uh, shelter on the island of Fane, where Tuco Braha lived. And Tuco, the good old Tuco, entertained them for a week or so until the storm abated. Now, what caused the storm? Well, we actually know. Because James was an authority on witchcraft. And they had an official investigation, like one of our tribunals. They had an official investigation and found a group of women had deliberately sent storms against his ship. Well, they knew how to respond to that. They burnt them. So that was affirmative action. So at the time, though, seriously, witchcraft was a branch of theology. Nowadays, it's a branch of climatology. So we shouldn't go overboard. We had a rotten winter, extreme rainfall and so on, but we can't make that link and we shouldn't make it because in making the link, we're giving ammunition to climate deniers to discredit the science. And we're also in danger of making very unwise policy decision. So let's keep our heads. Now, who are the real experts? Well, modesty prohibits me from mentioning the Royal Irish Academy, the fountain of knowledge and wisdom. But actually, the National Academies have a real role here. Quite recently, the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences in America issued a joint statement on climate. And it's very clear, very simple, very authoritative. And it's available to download on the web. It answers all the basic questions you might have in a sensible, sober way. We also have intensive study of the climate. It's one of the most intensively studied scientific problems ever. And we have the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which regularly reviews all the scientific evidence and looks uh, and summarizes it for our benefit. So if you want to go against what the IPC says, well, you'd better have a reason for it. You'd better have additional information or some additional knowledge which justifies that. It's all very well saying everyone's entitled to his opinion, but you have to have a basis for the opinion. Things are said which are not justifiable. Next summer, I don't know whether it's going to be warm or cold, but I can guarantee you one thing. Where there are droughts, the newspaper will say it's climate change. Wherever there are floods, the newspapers will say it's climate change. So everything seems to be ascribed to, to global warming. It's simply not justifiable. So where are we now? Well, we had the Kyoto Protocol. I think objectively anyone looking at that would have to call it a flop. CO2 levels are rising faster than ever. Coal-fired power stations are opening on a weekly basis. Fracking has, has uh, resulted in cheaper than ever fossil fuels. CO2 is going to rise faster than ever. Am I gloomy? Well, not really. The politicians at this stage are powerless to act, but I have great hopes for technology. If you look at the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't have radio, we didn't have domestic electricity, we had no aviation, 
within 30 years, they were all there. We had fantastic developments in computing, in the internet coming along, communications, great medical advances in health science, in food production, huge advances in all these areas. So I'm quite hopeful, hopeful that with all the research going on, we will find ways to store energy and to generate energy. There's no shortage of energy. The sun is beaming down vastly more energy than we can possibly use. We just have to find a way of harnessing it. So I'm quite optimistic. But something has to impel the politicians to act. Uh, I'll remind you of Sputnik when it went up in uh, 1957. This really galvanized uh, response in the West. The Russians were first to launch a satellite. They were first to put an animal in space, first to put a man in space, first to put a woman in space, first to photograph the backside of the moon. This really energized the Americans. And Kennedy, of course, came out and said, we're going to get to the moon and come back within 10 years. We need that kind of response. Another example is the Manhattan Project. The Americans were terrified that the Nazis would develop an atomic bomb. And so within five years, they had harnessed nuclear energy. I think we need to be courageous and visionary. We need to say, let's harness nuclear fusion. And let's do it by 2035. But they won't be able to do that unless there's something happening. And it will almost certainly be some kind of climate or environmental disaster. I was asked some time ago, what would make the Americans sign the Kyoto Protocol? And I said, maybe a hurricane hitting Washington, DC would do the trick. I was over optimistic. We saw Hurricane Sandy hitting New York two years ago. And it didn't really make very much difference. So we probably need an even bigger disaster. But the ultimate consequence will be that we'll get nuclear fusion and we'll all live happily ever after. Thank you. Thank you.